Hi, this is Paul. I want to continue working on my project about the split world. And this is following uh, Paul Maxwell's video on the hermeneutic of Jordan Peterson. And he starts getting into this whole philosophical theological trail that leads up to the thought of Jordan Peterson. And I, I think he does a great job of it. The only difficulty is that in my experience as a pastor, who are these people he's talking about? Who is Immanuel Kant? Who is Hegel? Why is he important? How does Hegel lead to Feuerbach, to to Marx, to to the modern world? What does this do with us? So I want to fill in some of this gap in terms of dealing with Paul's lead up to the question of now, when Paul Maxwell says biblical hermeneutic, that's a very laden term in terms of modernity and and studying the Bible as science. I'm not going to unpack that all right now, but I want us to have a bigger frame of reference in terms of the entire conversation and where Peterson fits into it and why he's having some of the ripples that he's having. I had a good conversation yesterday with Ron Dart. You can watch that. I just posted that yesterday. But it, it all feeds into this. And so we talked about this. So then I looked at uh, Verveke's video, what I, which I played in the video before. You have, as Charles Taylor calls, the, con the continuous cosmos, as I call it, the integrated enchanted. This is the pre-axial age. We are small creatures and we live in the garden of the gods. You, you can kind of see that represented in the Garden of Eden. Then the axial age comes and, and heaven and earth are split. You have a split world. You have the division between heaven and earth. Earth is a place of pain, of decay, of corruption. In, especially in Eastern traditions, earth is illusory. Heaven is ideal, eternal, unchanging, true, perfect. And and now there's there's tons that you can think about in this move in terms of, well, we discover that every example of love in this world will end with betrayal or death. But the idea of love is in the heavenlies and it doesn't decay and so you get into Plato and some of his ideas of forms and Verveke in his videos will talk about the axial age and then he'll go into Plato and then he'll go into Aristotle and then he'll go into the synthesis of Plato and Aristotle that is Plotinus and then he'll get into Augustine who was a Neoplatonist the Neoplatonists followed Plotinus and how Augustine uses there went Bucko I keep trying to put the lobster up there and he he falls down. The fall of the lobster. So, so of course, Augustine, one of the great Western saints, you know, so all of this gets, gets part as part of the Christian story. Verveke's video. Now, one way that you can conceptualize of the story of civilization is trying to bridge the gulf between heaven and earth. And one way to conceptualize the story of the Bible is that the story of the Bible is, is the, the story of the reunification of heaven and earth. Now, now often Christians and, and other religions too try to escape earth into heaven. But if you read all the way to the end of the Bible and you look at Revelation 21, there's a new heavens and a new earth, and it's all come together. And that's what the story of the Bible is about. The story of the Tower of Babel is a story of technology, human beings using technology, social technology, construction technology, in order to build a tower to the heavens. And this is our way to build a tower up, to reach up to God, to look him in the eye, and maybe even to displace God. One way of understanding the story of the Garden of Eden is that the man and the woman try to displace God. It's a coup d'etat where we no longer want God's administrations or desires of his world. We say to God, we want your stuff and we don't want you. It's another way to look at the parable of the prodigal son. Jacob's ladder, no buffered, no Charles Taylor buffered self in Jacob's ladder. Jacob in a dream sees a staircase going up to heaven, a stairway to heaven, Led Zeppelin. Um, she's building a stairway to heaven. 
Jacob's ladder has this stairway to heaven and angels are coming back and forth. But now, according to the Bible, earth is permeable to God, but we can't get up there. And that's the whole point of Jacob's ladder, that the angels come down, they're the messengers of God. Elijah goes up to heaven in a chariot of fire. God takes Enoch, maybe Moses, the assumption of Moses. So, so the Bible is full of these stories. And again, it's the tension between heaven and earth. Now, eventually we're going to have to get to Boltman and the modernizers. But before we get to, before we get to Boltman, we really have to deal with Kant and Hegel, just as, as Paul Maxwell said in his video. Now, another way to think about philosophy is philosophy itself tries to bridge the gulf between the phenomenal, now we're into Kant, and the ideal. And reason comes from above, empiricism comes from below, and if you remember the story that I keep telling, after the Protestant Reformation, the turn away from the texts, in the Protestant Reformation, Luther and the Protestants turn away from the authority of the institutional church, of the hierarchy of apostolic succession, and they invest their authority in the text. After the, after the Protestant Reformation and the wars of Europe, they're looking for a new stable platform upon which to build, and they turn from texts to the natural world where we can... We can learn what we need to from this stapler, and we will use reason, which is from above. We'll use the stuff of the world, which is from below, and we will bridge the gulf between earth and heaven. And the hope is that if we can get our minds around it, well, what do we, what do we, what do we mean when we say that? If we can grasp it, what do we mean when we say that? What will we then have? And I think a lot of this, I just finished. Uh, recording my sermon. A lot of this is about if we can only create models and systems that fully, finally capture the world, then we, then we what? Then we will have the world. Then we will dominate the world. Then we can finally colonize the world and colonize ourselves. And again, read C.S. Lewis's The Abolition of Man, the third chapter because Lewis takes it all the way to that point and then says, and what we will actually do is abolish humanity. But abolish for what? And this is where you get into this conundrum with where Brett Weinstein keeps landing that we're going to transcend our robot programming. You just have to stop and say, well, who's we? Well, is it the secret sacred self? This 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 true self that I imagine I have, which 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 isn't constructed by your genetics and your culture and all of this that we've been spending the last few hundred years trying to map out in order to capture the world? Where does this self come from? Or is this self merely a product of the material realities from the Big Bang forward, which is, of course, the materialist conception? So, so what exactly are we trying to do? Well, that's that's a really good question, but try, we continue. And so Immanuel Kant comes on the scene, and Immanuel Kant tries to, as Paul Maxwell said, tries to engage the question between the noumenal and the phenomenal. And the noumenal is, in the philosophy of Immanuel Kant, this is just scraped from Google, who scraped it from, from Botanica. This is the thing in itself. This is, this is as opposed to what Kant Font called the phenomenal. And so if you read Descartes, and, and ph philosophers within this period, they recognize that there, we don't see straight. We don't see right. We're, we're prone to getting fooled with tricks. And, and Jordan Peterson does that with the, the passing the basketball ball, the passing the basketballs and the guy in the monkey suit. And, and Verveke does that with his nine point problem. We, we see the world through filters. And, and then the idea is that if, like in Verveke's thing, if you can take your glasses off and look at the glass, maybe if I can, well, what am I doing there? Maybe if I can conceptually map what's in the glasses and how they interact with my eyes, then maybe Maybe I can conceptually grasp the whole thing, and then maybe I can dominate it. And and um, if you look at if you look at Augustine, uh, the libido dominante. This is the this is the 
this is the the hungering desire that that both animates us and consumes us and augustine writes about this a lot in the city of god but but this is the goal if we can if we can figure out the phenomenal and and our illusion from it if we can escape that illusion then we can see and know the noumenal and if we see and know it we believe in our hearts then we can dominate it then we can colonize it then we can control it now this is a this is a pretty ambitious thing for creatures that that struggle with their weight or, or struggle with eating right, or don't even know what to eat, or struggle with reining in our sexual impulses, or struggle with with money, or struggle with relationships. That that if we can finally see everything, but again, you're back to the Brett Weinstein circle, where okay, if you see everything, what then? Who exactly is dominating or controlling, or what exactly? is dominating or controlling and actually in just about any endeavor of life including politics well we can't trust ourselves so we set up these structures but who is going to run the structures well people and the people will corrupt the structures and use them for their own ends and whether that's patreon and mastercard or the constitution and trump or the desire to impeach him it doesn't matter we just keep telling these stories around and around again and again the same thing over and over so so the path to this stuff flows through Immanuel Kant. And so we should get a sense of who Kant is and what's going on with him. And as is often the case, I'll use uh, Philip Carey's excellent philosophy and religion in the West, and he'll give us a sense of who Kant is. And so we'll, we'll jump in now. Descartes. Now, the turn to the subject, remember, means the turn to the subject of knowledge. The subject of the sentence, I know X, right? X is the object of knowledge. I is the subject of knowledge. Kant executed a turn to that subject of knowledge, that I who knows, that was more thorough uh, than any, any before him. So, the now, now what's interesting about this, as, as Peterson notes, is that you have this turn to the subject, but what we do with this is eliminate subjects. It's a turn to an anonymous subject. It's a turn to a mythical subject. It's a turn to an impersonal subject. It's every man and any man, which is also no man. The notion that Kant is working with is that there's something which the subject of knowledge does, which makes experience of physical objects possible. Now, now, this will be critical in the Jordan Peterson-Sam Harris conversation. And again, the four videotaped conversations, they all swirl around this issue. Jordan Peterson keeps saying to Sam Harris, you don't take Kant seriously. He doesn't say those words, but that's essentially what he says through him. Because we don't just see objects. We see them through filtered eyes. And we can't see them any other way. And unless you account for these filters, your whole imagination of applying reason to a world of objects is simply fantasy. Right? Somehow, experience itself, the sense experience of a, of a world of experience, the empirical or natural world, is dependent on something that the subject of knowledge does. I know is a very active verb. The I who does the knowing, in some sense, makes the knowledge. And that's the, um, the notion that we need to articulate at this point in the lecture. This is the crucial notion. How is it that I, the knower, make a world of experience possible? Go back to, say, the situation of an infant. Right? We don't know what an infant's consciousness is like, but we can say a few things about it. It's Which is an amazing thing, the fact that all of us have been infants, and we don't know what that consciousness is like, and so we, we have psychologists, and we test, and we research, but, but we don't, and when we say we don't know what it's like, that's the conocer in Spanish, not the saber. That's, the, that's this, this deep sense of knowing that we know in, in how we know a person as opposed to how we know some fact. It seems to be unorganized. The infant doesn't seem to have uh, a notion of objects. Kant supposed that without the organizing activity of the subject, what you have is a rhapsody of sensations. 
And you can imagine that as the situation of an infant, right? The uh, example of an infant is, is my example rather than Kant's, but I think it helps make sense of what Kant is doing. Imagine the situation of an infant, a rhapsody of sensations, Kant would call it. We've got sights, sounds, smells, all these sensations, but they don't cohere into a world of experience. In particular, what the infant doesn't have can be called object permanence. That's a, a phrase from modern or uh, recent psychology. Imagine a rattle, right? You've got an infant looking at a rattle. The infant closes its eyes, opens its eyes again, there's the rattle again. We as adults will think of it as the same rattle as before. But that's a concept that the infant doesn't really have. There seems to be uh, strong evidence that, the, that the, inf the infant really doesn't understand that, that blob of visual sensation as a single object. And now when we say, well, first of all, we can't peer into the brain of an infant, but when we say the infant doesn't really have or the infant doesn't really understand, what we're really saying here is that the infant doesn't really, isn't really able to control, that the infant isn't able to colonize, that the infant isn't able to take whatever the thing is that is the self of the infant and oppose, impose it on its world and control it in a way that the infant can achieve the ends that it desires. That, that's what we mean by this. Um, doesn't identify it as a permanent object through time and doesn't connect the sound of the rattle and the touch of the rattle and the sight of the rattle. Doesn't objectify those sensations and put them together as one object. Right, it can't manage it like we easily manage a rattle and even an infant to the degree that we in fact do manage infants. The infant does not to use Kant's terms, synthesize the manifold in sensation, <laughs> which means we've got this multitude of sensations, and in order to make it into a world of experience, we have to put them all together and uh, attach them to this notion of objects. The very notion of an object... See, and right there, so it's the, it's the, it's the subject interacting with the objective world in a productive way that actually, again, implicit in all of this is that it's achieving the ends it's achieving the goals that that agent, that infant, that being has for it. And, and when we see, as we call developing, as that infant grows and rattles become dull, because you take that thing and you shake it and you shake it, shake it. I could shake this rattle all day long. I'm just going to hear those beans move in the little plastic shell. And we're bored with that and we're on to the next thing. We're ambitious We've got the libido dominante that's, that's working and working and working in us. ...of knowledge, a continuing object of experience, is something that we, in a sense, have to make. We the knowers, we the subjects, the I who knows, has to know that object. We have to objectify it, or to use a term that, that I'll introduce at this point, we have to conceptualize it as an object. If we, the knowers, don't conceptualize those objects, we don't get objects of experience. All we get is that phantasmagoria, that rap rhapsody of sensations, a bunch of sights and sounds that are all kind of flowing around in our minds, but don't add up to a world that we can experience, a world that for, uh, about which we can have empirical knowledge, scientific knowledge. We have to conceptualize the world in order to have a world of objects that we can experience. So the world of experience is in part a product of our conceptualizing activity. Okay. The world of experience is in part a product of our conceptualizing activity. And again, this was the point that Peterson kept trying to make to Sam Harris in those videos, and it doesn't appear that Peterson was ever satisfied that Sam got it. In activity. We start with what you could call sense data, right? Data means given. Right? So we got these givens, these, these sensations. We start with them, but we have to organize them, conceptualize them in order to produce a world of experienced objects. So the subject, the I who knows objects, contributes to the possibility of their being objects of experience. That's Kant's basic notion. If the subject doesn't conceptualize, if I don't conceptualize and turn those uh, sensations into objects 
identify them, conceptualize them as objects, then I don't have any experience of all at all. Uh, all I have is a bunch of sensations running through my mind that I can't remember, can't uh, uh, get any empirical knowledge about, can't make any theories about, right? I'm just in the situation of an infant who doesn't know anything about the world. So the key notion here is that there's a subjective basis, a basis in the subject or the knower for the possibility of objects of experience. There's a subjective ground for the objectivity of empirical knowledge. In other words, your objectivity is dependent on the subject. And again, that you listen to that, you say, well, that doesn't make sense because the definition of objective is that it's not dependent on the subject. But this is where we get into this question of a monarchical vision, of an imagined clean room, that there's this world of objects that I can somehow interact with. And Kant's point is you once you once you enter into that world, you contaminate it. Because the only way you can apprehend it is through the subject. Consciousness. Empirical knowledge. Objectivity is dependent on a certain kind of subjectivity the kind of subjectivity that conceptualizes the world in terms of permanent objects with permanent qualities, colors and such, which says, oh, that color, that little baby blue color, that belongs to the rattle, which is also the source of that sound, right? It connects things, synthesizes things, conceptualizes things, and the result is a world of objects, of rattles, of people, of uh, the kind of objects you can do physics about, the kind of objects about which you can get physical and experimental and empirical knowledge. So empirical knowledge, the kind of knowledge you get in the sciences, is dependent on that conceptualizing activity of our minds, right? The objectivity of the sciences is dependent on that conceptualizing activities, uh, activity of our minds. Now, one of the basic principles of conceptualization, to, to move to another illustration, is cause and effect. Remember the discussion we had about that with Hume, right? We've got these patterns. Now. We don't know what ultimately produces those patterns. So how can we know for sure that this pattern of cause and effect is going to keep on going, right? Hume had said, well, we just have this custom, right? We have this custom of expecting cause and effect to happen that way. You know, whenever a billiard ball hits another billiard ball, we have this expectation that the second billiard ball will move. The expectation doesn't get disappointed. So we've got this custom of expecting it to happen. And that's good enough to get by with. But Kant wants to do something more than that. He's more ambitious than that. He wants to say, in order for us to have scientific knowledge, we have to have some a priori knowledge about causality. A and if you remember, again, Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson, how often in those videos Jordan Peterson presses this a priori knowledge? It's what they dealt with over and over again. A priori, A space P-R-I-O-R-I, means knowledge in advance of experience, right? In order to have metaphysical knowledge about the physical world, and Kant thinks we can have metaphysical knowledge about the physical world, he's proposing to make metaphysics into a science for the first time, right? In order to have that knowledge, Kant said... See, now, even that turn, or he's proposing to make metaphysics into a science. What does, what does that mean? Again, I think it means this conceptualization that we will turn it into something that we can dominate, that we can manipulate. And then you have to ask the question, well, who's we? That knowledge, Kant says, we've got to have this conceptualization going on. But we have to have that conceptualization. We have to have a priori knowledge in advance of experience in order to have uh, the possibility of physical science. Because physical science has to depend on the assumption that there's cause and effect going on, right? Physical science, the kind of thing you do in a laboratory, takes for granted that the law of cause and effect works. It has to take that for granted in advance. It can't prove that. You can't go into a physics laboratory and prove that the law of cause and effect will work in the future because everything you do in the physics lab laboratory takes for granted that the cause and effect already is operating, right? You can't prove what you've already assumed. And physics has to assume that cause and effect is valid. How can it do that, right? How can we establish in advance of all empirical knowledge that cause and effect is a valid principle of the physical world? Well, Kant's argument is it's a valid principle of the physical world, and we know that in advance because we put it there. 
Our minds put cause and effect in the world of experience. There wouldn't be a world of experience without us conceptualizing the world of experience in terms of cause and effect. So that conceptualization in terms of cause and effect generates the world of experience. And the world of experience is the physical world for Kant. So that guarantees that any world of experience we have will necessarily have cause and effect in it. Right? So physics, which works in the world of experience, will always find that things work in terms of cause and effect. That's just how it has to go. Because we put so, it there. The way to think about this, I'd suggest, is that instead of finding the ultimate causal power in the essences of things in the world, as in Aristotle, Kant is suggesting that the source of causality is in us, right, in the subject, not in the object. That means that, as in uh, Locke, we don't know the essences of things. And the way Kant will put it is, we don't know the way things are in themselves. Remember the noumenal, the way things are in themselves. All we know is how we experience them, the way they appear in our experience, right? That's what physical knowledge is. It's knowledge of the way objects have to appear in our experience. Knowledge of the way objects appear when we conceptualize them using cause and effect and, and these other notions like object and um, uh, sensations um, or object and um, colors, for instance, right? When you think of a rattle with a color, you're thinking of a thing or a substance with a quality or a color, right? That's another category, just like cause and effect. If we didn't have those categories to conceptualize the world with, we wouldn't have a world of experience. So every world of experience we can possibly imagine will have those categories, cause and effect, substance and uh, quality, and so on and so forth. So that's why we can have a priori knowledge of the physical world in advance of experience. But we cannot know things as they are in themselves apart from our experience. That so we can't, there's the gulf, there's the gulf. Okay, now we're not conceptualizing or representing it as a gulf between heaven and earth. We're representing it as a gulf between the experience that we have and the things as they are, the real world, as we like to use that word. Experience. That's the crucial limitation that Kant wants to set on the ambitions of, real, of reason. So, the way Kant will put this is that because we do know the world of experience, we do know physical objects, right? We know that they will behave according to laws of, of uh, cause and effect. That's a form of knowledge. It's the knowledge of physics. So, Kant will call himself an empirical realist. In terms of, of the world of experience, he's a realist. He thinks that uh, we have real knowledge about those things, right? But he calls it also the world of appearance, the world of how things have to appear to us in experience. That's a real world for Kant, but it's empirically real. It's the real world of experience. Whereas things as they are in themselves, right, the deep inner essence of things or whatever, we can't know that. So Kant will call himself a transcendental idealist, at the same time as calling himself an empirical realist, right? The, the world of experience is real. It's got real objects, even though, you know, we contribute to how those ob objects are constituted. Now, at some point, I want to bring in N.T. Wright and his Gifford lectures, because one of the things that Wright notes is the difference between, so we're going to have all these Germans over here, Kant's uh, a Prussian, the, the, the Germans, Austrians, Swiss, all these from North, Central, not really Central Europe, because Central Europe's further further east but but Ger the german the german language world uh, these gonna, they're gonna, these going to be german idealists and and you can see these you know even these terms kind of get swapped around a lot but so you're going to have kant and hegel and then we're going to go to boltman and we're going to go to tillich and we're going to look at all these individuals coming out of this coming out of the this german speaking world and now nt right then is going to contrast those to some of the English, remember Hume is English. So so you're gonna get a different you're gonna get a different take on it from the English philosophers than you're going to get from the German philosophers. To add just another confusing layer into this this long, complicated story. Constituted. But um, what we can't know is the world of things as they are in themselves, and that's the sense in which Kant is a transcendental idealist. That is Everything we know is something to which our mind makes a contribution. Our ideas contribute to making the, the world of experience. And in that sense, Kant is an idealism, an idealist.
right? He's an idealist because our ideas help constitute the way the world is. So Kant is, in effect, denying that we, we had no essences. He's denying that we have this intellectual intuition that Plato thought we had, where you could see essences, right? We don't have anything like that. We have sense perception, and then we have this conceptualizing activity. And that sets the limits of reason. For what that means is that our reason cannot operate outside of the limits of experience, outside of the limits of conceptualization, right? Our knowledge is confined to the world of experience, the world of physics. Everything beyond that is belief, not knowledge. And yet, now this is an interesting Right there, belief, not knowledge. So, so you've got another gulf that's developing there. Well, we believe this, but we don't know it. Oh, well, okay, what do you mean? What does it mean to know something? And, and what sneaks in under, underneath here is to know something, is to be able to manipulate it and control it and to colonize it and to master it. Now, this is an interesting point. Reason wants to have knowledge of what is beyond the world of experience. That's why Plato talked about the, the immortality of the soul and the forms, which are beyond the world of sense experience, right? Kant says we can't have knowledge of that sort of thing, and yet we want it. Reason itself desires knowledge of the whole ball of wax, of the origin of the world, why the world hangs together, uh, whether the soul is immortal. Reason itself wants the kind of knowledge that Plato wanted. Reason, in a sense, is romantic. Reason has infinite aspirations. It keeps wanting to understand how everything hangs together. But it can't do that. It can only understand how the world of experience hangs together. We, all, we can only have a metaphysics of nature, a metaphysics of how the physical world hangs together, not a metaphysics that explains God and the soul. So reason, with these infinite aspirations, this desire to go beyond all experience, needs to be limited, needs to be put in its place. That's the work of critique, and that's why Kant's great, uh, great work of philosophy is called the critique of pure reason. Pure reason, reason uh, the reason, reason of metaphysics, wants to get to prove the existence of God and the soul, which are beyond all experience, and it can't. Right? All it can do is show about uh, the, the metaphysical structure of physics as we have to conceive it or conceptualize it uh, when we're uh, working with the world of experience. So, what, we, what is beyond the bounds of possible experience, we cannot know about. We cannot know the essence of things as they are in themselves. We cannot know the nature of the soul or God. All those objects of um, traditional metaphysics, the things that Plato and even Aristotle and Aquinas and Augustine thought that we could know about. So you can see Kant is going to end up rejecting the, the traditional proofs for the existence of God. Now, now it's interesting that this... What Kant has pulled in here has become, in many ways, has, has won, has run the table. And that then gets into our language that we say, well, well, I can know that I'm holding a stapler, but I can't know God. And, and right in there comes all of the religious language that, no, you can know God. Well, what do you mean by no? And back and forth you go, back and forth you go. And, and so that's, you know, Jung says, I don't believe, I know. And, and so now we, implicit in Kant, we get this movement towards, well, so, so I can know things that are in my experiential realm, within the realm of consciousness, within this, this domain that I experience. What if I can pull God into this domain? Well, then I can know him. Well, you've got the incarnation, you've got Jesus, of course. Um, psychedelics. I was just watching the the video that Rebel Wisdom posted today on an older guy who studied a bunch of this stuff and was thinking about maps of language for all of that. And maybe I'll do a video on that. That I, I think there's stuff to talk about in there. But but you know. Well, what do you mean you know? Well, I experience it. Well, what you do then is you have obviously set up a hierarchy and you've said, well, now I've got experience over reason. But now we have to bring Kant back in and say, okay, but you have experience, but that's the point. Experience is part of the phenomenal. And and reason, well, where does reason come in? Well, we bring, so, so I have an experience. Well, what do you bring to that experience? I bring all sorts of things to that experience. I bring all of these filters to that experience. I bring interpretive filters to that experience. So let's talk about the Bible. So the Bible is the word of God. The Bible is the revelation of God. 
I don't care what kind of, whether you believe in mechanical inspiration, whether you believe that, you know, an angel of the God dictated this text to you. Every time you approach this text, you approach it with your, you approach it with your a priori filters. And you might say, well, that sounds troubling. Yeah, but it also is explaining in terms of why we always have the dilemma of interpretation, because we're always approaching these things with our filters. We can't help but interact with them with our filters and in fact we always violate the sanctity of the clean room and you know i'm using that language and suddenly i'm using clean unclean common holy and you begin to say oh my goodness all this old testament stuff maps onto this stuff doesn't it yeah it does god as well as for the immortality of the soul and for free will here's how the rejection goes um, now, mind you, he's not rejecting religion. He's not rejecting the existence of God. He's saying we cannot know about God and the soul, but we can believe them. What he's ultimately doing, he's suggesting, is setting limits to reason in order to make room for faith. So here's his critiques of the, the key arguments for the existence of God. Let me give you um, first a sort of... Um, example of the kind of critique he makes. Think of the Aristotelian argument for a first cause, right? All the causes in the world have to go back to a first cause or a first mover. Remember that argument from Aquinas, right? You've got this series of causes within the world of physics, the world of experience, which lead back to a first cause. Now Kant claims that this argument can't possibly work because the first cause is not an object of experience. Right? We cannot have sense knowledge of the first cause or first mover, which is God. We can know about individual causes and movers within the world of experience, but we can't know that first cause. So, we, um, in other words, when we try to prove the existence of this first cause, reason is overstepping its bounds. It's talking about something about which it can have a concept, but it can't prove anything. Because we can only prove things a priori, in advance of experience, um, if it's bound into the way we conceptualize the world of experience, right? So a priori proofs, which had been the basis of metaphysics, are now confined to the world of experience, right? We can have a priori knowledge about the world of experience. We cannot have a priori rational knowledge in advance of all experience about things that have nothing to do with experience at all. We cannot know God that way, Kant claims. So Kant, in fact, goes through the three uh, traditional types of proof for God's existence. And he's the one who identifies these three types of proofs as the, the only three possible proofs for God's existence, the only three metaphysical proofs for God's existence. There's the ontological proof, which we uh, identified uh, with uh, Anselm and Descartes. There's cosmological proofs, arguing from uh, the existence of the world to a creator of the world. And there's teleological proofs, arguing from design in the world to an intelligent designer. Although, as a footnote, Kant calls the, the teleological proofs physico-theological. Um, it's been traditional since then to call it a teleological proof from the Greek word telos, meaning purpose or design. Well, let's look at those, uh, the last two types of proof first, the cosmological and the teleological. These are both proofs about the structure of the world, and it, they, they trace the structure, nature of the world, back to God. Now, that is, they start with the world of experience, right? We see cause and effect in the world, or actually we, we put it there by conceptualizing it. We see design in the world, we see evidence of it, and then we try to trace that back to God as the source of the existence of the world or the source of the order in the world. So what we're trying to do is begin with matters of experience and arrive at a concept of God. And there Kant says that's where we go wrong. Because all we can get through pure reason, is a concept of God, right? Pure reason can give us a concept of God, but it can give us no experience of the reality that coincides with the concept. All we get is, is reason's concept of God, and that's not good enough, because um, no argument can show that, that we can get from the concept of God to the existence of God. And in many ways, again, when you follow Peterson and Harris, especially when they're with Brett Weinstein, because the two talks with Brett, seem to keep a little bit more philosophical. The talks with Douglas Murray seem to be a little bit more pragmatic and political. But 
this is often the the complaint about Peterson is Peterson leaves us merely with a concept. And I think again, this shows the Kantian how how Peterson has, whether directly through reading Kant or just by virtue of the way that we are all downstream from Kant and how he has so deeply impacted our assumptions. Peterson's conception of God is purely concept. Well, and then when you, and if, if in fact that was Peterson's, that's where Peterson left off, Sam Harris would be comfortable and Brett Weinstein would be comfortable. But Peterson doesn't leave off. He keeps stepping over the line and saying, I'm not going to shut that door. I'm not going to completely close it. And at some point, Sam Harris tries to bully him on the resurrection and Peterson kind of concedes. But, you know, Peterson, then he, he'll, he'll, he'll step back. He's He's seen too much. He's done too much. And maybe Sam Harris should do more mushrooms or something because Peterson is, is not willing to quite leave it there in the realm of conception. But he's but he's kind of stuck there and he's stuck there in a sense with Kant and and he's got his reasons. The existence of God. The ontological argument would show that if it worked. And that's why for Kant, the ontological argument is actually the most basic and fundamental of all the proofs for the existence of God. The idea of the ontological argument is that you can start with the concept of God and show that by the very nature of the concept, this is the concept of something that has to exist. That if you understand the concept of God, then you know that this kind of thing has to exist. And Kant's argument... And, and this is really interesting. And, and again and again, when I listen to Peterson, the ontological argument comes to mind. because, And, and I think that's part of the reason Peterson is bread-pilling people. Because he takes him right to the line and you almost get to the point of believing, well, then everything is set for this for God to be there, of course he must be there. What's what's the downside in stepping over the line? But Peterson has a significant downside. If, if Peterson does formally step over that line, that line is a has a big social value. And if you're on one side or the other, the people on the other side will either accept you or dismiss you based on that. And so Peter keeps straddling Peterson keeps straddling the line, and that's why, again going back to my my office video, that's why he's so He's so darn interesting. He he keeps he's oscillating right on that line and drives us nuts, but also excites us. The argument against that is um, classic and crucial. Kant argues that existence is not a real predicate. What he means by that is, existence is not like white or great or intelligent or any other quality of a thing. Right? You can take a thing and say, um, there exists something that is white. And the whiteness is a real predicate or quality of the thing. But the existence is not a real predicate. Uh, the existence cannot be part of the concept of a thing. Is the, the concept of a thing can contain all sorts of predicates, right? All swans are white, let us say. Uh, or uh, all human beings are rational. Uh, it's part of the concept of a human being to be rational. It's part of the concept of a swan to be white. Um, that they thought this before they discovered black swans in Australia, but leave that be. The, the notion is that, that we can have certain concepts and certain predicates or qualities belong to the very nature of that concept. But existence, existence is not such a quality. It's not a quality that you can add to the concept of things. Um, the way Kant will put it is 20 real dollars are not any more than 20 imaginary dollars. Um, the, the difference between the real dollars and the non-existent dollars is not a quality, right? There's still 20 of them, whether they're existent or non-existent. Um, the point is that um, the existence itself doesn't have the same status as the 20 or the white or the green or all those other qualities. Um, the, this is a hard notion to grasp. Let me see if I can illustrate it for you from modern formal logic. It turns out that in modern logic, again, existence is not a predicate. Existence works differently than other uh, notions. Um, for instance, if you wanted to say all swans are white in modern logic, you would say for all x, if x is a swan, then x is white. Right? You've got the, the, the predicate swan, you've got the predicate white, and you link them. Suppose you wanted to say there is a white swan. Then you say there exists an x such that it is, it is a swan and it is white. 
right? The, the, the existence notion is an operator rather than a predicate, right? There exists an X, right, such that X is white, X is a swan. Uh, the, the predication is X is white, X is a swan. But you don't say just X exists. You've got to say there exists an X such that, right? So the there exists an X is what's called um, in mathematics a, an operator, right? It's not a predicate. It's existence and non-existence is, is handled in an entirely different way than this notion of predication. So Kant argues as a result of this that if existence is not a real predicate, then you cannot get from the concept of God to the existence of God. Because no concept contains the notion of its own existence, right? Um, no concept of a swan contains the notion that this swan has to exist, right? It's just a concept. Uh, whether it exists or not is something we can only determine through experience, right? We can only determine whether a swan exists by seeing it, right? Or having some kind of experience of it or inferring from experience to some other thing that we can experience. But God is beyond all possible experience. And therefore, we cannot infer his existence. He's a, the existence of God is a concept we can have. We can have a concept of God, but we cannot actually have experience of his existence. So the notion here is that metaphysics has its limits. Kant is establishing this revolution because he wants to establish metaphysics as a science for the first time. He's going to turn his back on the kind of metaphysics you get in Plato and Aristotle, Augustine and Aquinas, where you claim to have uh, knowledge, uh, actually kind of intellectual vision of the forms of things. We don't have that kind of knowledge. We don't have that kind of intuition. Maybe the angels do. Kant is willing to suggest there might be such a thing as intellectual intuition or intellectual vision. But we don't have that kind of intellectual perception. We have to perceive things through the senses, through our experience. And we have to generate that experience through this conceptualizing activity. And we cannot know anything that goes beyond that conceptualizing activity. So Kant is setting limits to metaphysical reason. That does not mean that there isn't a God. It just means that our knowledge of God, or rather our belief in God, is going to come through a different way than through metaphysics. We won't have knowledge of God. We will have, Kant thinks, belief in God, but we're going to get to it through a different route than proofs. And um, it's beyond our experience. It actually is rooted in our ethical life, our life as people who choose the good and the right. And we'll leave it there. And the next chapter, as he, he said earlier before I started playing this, he gives two chapters to Kant, the only per other philosopher he gave two chapters to was Plato, because Kant is this important, and then he'll go into the categorical imperative and the basis for religion, and again, if if you've got an Audible account, I highly recommend philosophy and religion in the West, but I'm going to skip over this next chapter, although it's also very good. You get to Schleiermacher, who, now what happens here, and this is, now with Schleiermacher, we're not really dealing with a philosopher, we're dealing with a theologian, and Schleiermacher, so we have this gulf between the noumenal, the phenomenal, and the noumenal, and that's what Paul Maxwell talks about. And and this is in some ways analogous to the gulf between heaven and earth, and the gulf between the forms and our life in the cave for Plato. So you've got the you've got this gulf, and this gulf then haunts both German philosophy and German theology. And now, as many of you were listening to Philip Carey talk about Kant and his limits of reason, and he's talking about experience, I know, again, because of the conversation that we've been having, a lot of you are saying, but I can experience God. And then you look at, 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 at Benjamin Boyce's hierarchy of experience. You know, you have this mystic class and prophet class over cleric class and, you know, church pew sitter class. This is commonly set up, and so we can have this experience of religion. And, and also within the church, you have elements of this. Pentecostals, for example, there's a self-validation of experience if you are speaking in tongues or if you're slain by the Spirit or if you're in this incre incredibly emotive religious experience. You have this experience feeling of awe, non-Christian areas, or I walk into Yosemite, maybe a nature religion, or I do a psychedelic with a with a shaman, and so then I have this other experience. And so 
what happens is, of course, well, well, now I experience, so now I know. And and that, again, is part of, you know, part of this entire framework we're dealing with. Well, well Schleiermacher, because of the skepticism that's built into Kant, and because Kant wins so much, well, then what is the basis for religion? And so what you have in is this this series of theologians that keep trying to save Christianity from skepticism and and they no longer believe what is socially pressured to be naive things such as the authority of the Bible or the relationship between the Bible and history and all that kind of thing. So so then you kind of slip off into mythology and mythology is handy again you can listen to NT Wright Gifford lectures on this. Mythology is handy because well the Bible isn't about what stuff happened in history. The Bible is speaking in mythological terms, which are true for all times and places. Okay? So that's a move that you make. And Peterson makes that move a lot. So it says, well, in contrast to the fundamentalists, whatever happened in Genesis, well, we can see that it's mythologically true. And then, then one of the interesting things that Peterson does with with Genesis is he says, well, it's kind of historically true, but it's a representational history in that you have the fruit and the woman and the snake and our development as as pattern seeing creatures and and all of this going on. And and so it's in that way again that Peterson is so interesting because he's he's saying, well the Bible is history, but it's history spoken in a certain kind of way. And you see that's not Many contemporary theologians will just look at the synoptic problem, and maybe you know Esther and I would have a debate on this. But what? How do Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John represent history? Now, what we tend to do, as N.T. Wright notes in the English tradition, is we polarize: it did or it didn't happen. Well, then you say, well, let's say, let's say it didn't happen. But then I really want to keep religion because I find it's helpful for keeping the family together and it's helpful for, for, for giving me a sense of meaning and purpose and, and fulfillment and community. Religion is, is tremendously, religion is tremendously useful. It binds and blinds. It brings communities together. All the sociological stuff that you can hear from Jonathan Haidt or, or Adam Friended. Religion is terribly useful in those terms. Okay. So we want to keep it around, but we're skeptical in that the old beliefs of believing that the Bible has historical validity, or we get the positivism, believing that the Bible is completely historically valid, and to the point that there's two Jerichos with the blind man, and you can read Josh McDowell, and, and, and some people take the Bible so that, well, it, it has to be true in every way, so... So this problem of whether Jesus was crucified on a Thursday or a Friday, well, we've got to solve this problem, and we're not going to use, let's say, the move that John has Jesus being crucified on Thursday in order to have him align with the, the sacrifice of the lambs, thus connecting him to, to Exodus, and you know all of these different moves that have gone on a lot if you listen to Christians trying to work through the question of the question surrounding the Bible and history. You cut through that if you just go to mythology and you say, well, it's the Bible is mythically true. And and that's kind of nice in order to kind of push away the questions about, about uh history in the Bible. And you can see these things played out a lot. I mentioned on Twitter that that I was going to mention John Sook's sermon. Now, John Sook is a former Christian Reformed pastor who left the Christian Reformed Church and became a minister of the United Church of Canada. A lot of this because he wrote this book, um, Not John Sook, Not Sure, A Pastor's Journey Towards uh, From Faith to Doubt. And he tells, it's, a, it's it's biogra it's autobiographical, but he he talks about this journey that he makes from being a good Christian reform boy who actually rose to the height of the Christian reform hierarchies. He was an editor of the Banner. He was a missionary in the Philippines. He was a a pastor who pastored, you know, 
important churches. So John, in terms of Christian reform hierarchies, John Sook reached the top in many ways. He reached elite status of Christian reform hierarchy, and he got all the way to the top and decided he was filled with doubt. And he had too much doubt to actually believe a lot of the more rigorous things that being a rigorous subscriptional things that being a Christian reform minister requires. And so he jumped to the United Church of Canada. He calls himself, at least last time I read on his blog, a weak theist. And John and I will swap emails or social media comments and so on and so forth. John's a good guy. He has a church in, he has a church in Ontario, but he's no longer a Christian foreign minister because he can no longer believe these things. And so I, I noted this week he was he was talking about the virgin birth and the resurrection and and as is the as is the attempt in many churches after Kant after all of this philosophical talk. We can't, we can't know these things. We can't know if Jesus came out of the tomb. And, and even, John, even Sam Harris can't completely say it didn't happen. But Sam Harris will say almost certainly not. And, you know, the same for the virgin birth. And, well, we can't say these things. So, so then what to do with religion? We've got all these buildings. We've got all these traditions. We've got all this meaning. And if you just kind of throw the whole thing away, and some of you have done that, and you know that there's a cost to that. So, so why can't we keep all of the stuff that we know is very real, like the family stuff and the traditions and the things we feel. Why can't we keep all that stuff and not worry about all of the the messy questions about history and metaphysics and all of that? Well, well, Schleiermacher comes on the scene, and and so then you get this this feeling um, feeling as the basis of religion, and and Schleiermacher. God consciousness, piety as feeling, the feeling of utter dependence. I mentioned that in a previous video. Feeling of utter dependence as God consciousness. Um, and so what happens in Christian theology and in Christian churches, especially Protestant churches, but also to some degree in, in Catholic churches, I don't know if the Orthodox has their liberal wing, they probably do, but, but okay, so we're, we, we want to keep Christianity, and so let's have it be about feelings. And, and then this really is the dawn of kind of this liberal church tradition within Christianity. And because there's all this skepticism of, of things we can't know about. So then you have Schleiermacher, and then you get to Hegel, which is a philosophical history of religion. Now, what Paul Maxwell does in his video is he... He talks about how he basically looks at Jordan Peterson looking at, let's say, a succession of ancient Near East religions and wars leading to thesis, antithesis, and then Marduk. And Marduk is, is other gods were subsumed into Marduk. And, and Paul Maxwell uses that as an example of Peterson's Hegelianism. I, I think actually the Hegelianism of the waters that Peterson is swimming in goes a lot deeper than that. And I can we can see that as Hegelianism sets up Freierbach, which will eventually set up Freud and Marx the, and the hermeneutics of suspicion. But what's important to see from Hegel here is that this, okay, the skepticism which says, well, we can't really have knowledge of God in this way, as Kant says. We have limits, a critique of pure reason. We can't get to God from reason if we're working from below here. Remember, we're trying to have the, the, the Tower of Babel. Well, then the question of where is God and what is God? And now if you listen to Hegel, so I'm going to play some of Philip Carey on Hegel. If you, if you listen and you begin to get to get a sense of what Hegel is talking about, about spirit or better Geist. Well, well, God is, and this comes through in Peterson's conversation with Sam Harris, God is the a priori structure. Now again, Peterson is an open agnostic in that he's not, he's not ready to close it off and say, well, that's all God is. Weinstein and Harris are ready to close it off and say, that's all God is, but Peterson's not ready to do that. And, and Peterson, not ready to go there. And so Peterson says, at least we can, we can see, we, when we talk, when we use the word God, we can do so with philosophical credibility within this framework. 
And, and Hegel is really important for setting up, for, in a sense, relocating God from the heavenlies down here among us in a special way. So I'm going to rearrange some things. I think I'll just pause while I do that so you don't have to watch me do it. So I am going to play a little bit of a carry on Schleiermacher because I think this will help. And this will also help contextualize when you look at what religious con what has happened to religious conversations in terms of for lack of a better term more new age or Jungian or spiritual but not religious conversations because Schleiermacher I think is important in that now Schleiermacher was speaking to uh, a, a Christian context well Schleiermacher was deeply embedded in Christendom and now here later we get to this but I think you can you can hear the connections Right, as if what religion fundamentally is, is the feeling I have when I'm alone in the woods or when I get home and I get, get in touch with my feelings, uh, as if religion didn't really have to do with our life in a community, um, in a public space. Now, Schleiermacher does bring... And, and if you listen to my, my conversation with, with Ron Dart, and we're talking about Peterson, and Peterson has, has not really made the move from the individual to the communal as such with respect to a lot of the values that he's bringing to the table and and that's where religion is something now with peterson it's not about feeling so much but with schleiermacher schleiermacher really says well we can't we can't know this stuff so they've completely bought into kant we can't know this stuff but i still have feelings i do have experience and so that will be religion and that will be where religion lies it does bring the church into things because the church is necessary for communicating God consciousness. But that's secondary, right? The primary thing is God consciousness. The primary thing is that feeling. Likewise, Schleiermacher... And, and you can also have a sense in this of, well, let's say an evangelical. One of the many evangelicals in North America who will say, well, I'm a Christian. I believe in God and, and I was baptized at some point, but I don't go to church and I don't participate in a community, but I do believe in God. Well, how do you know you believe in God? Because I feel it here and I, I wear a golden cross or I have a Bible or I pray sometimes like when I'm in trouble or I need a parking space or or it's it's again it's about this feeling this is you now we're downstream from Hegel and Schleiermacher likewise Schleiermacher has a hard time making sense of Christian doctrines which aren't about consciousness right he doesn't have much to say about crucifixion and resurrection as or the, the role they play in redemption um, his interpretation of the events of crucifixion and resurrection focus on the God consciousness of Jesus. What we need to know about Jesus is precisely his personality. So later in the 19th century, uh, you have the, the, the liberal Protestant quest for the historical Jesus, which is fundamentally a quest for a, a lost personality, attempt, a, an attempt to recover the personality and consciousness of Jesus to communicate it to other people. Right, so and, and you can, again, hear, and so my friend John Sook, in his own personal journey from faith to doubt, if you read his sermons, he, you know, this is, this is about consciousness. This is about recapturing consciousness. But now in church, we're going to recapture consciousness through moral activity. Again, that's post-Kantian. We're going to recapture consciousness through, through feelings, through, through knowing each other, through action in the world, through making this world a, a better place. Now, now remember, and what we're also beginning to subtly see, remember in the axial age, we have this split world. Well, part of what happens with, with Protestant liberalism is that, and, and with and with secularism in the West is, is well, we're living in the iron box of, of secularism here. And there's no up. We're in this box. We can't know anything. Maybe there's something out there, but we can't know it. So, so we're in this box. And so now, well, we have to bring heaven on earth, utopian. Look at my, look at my conversation with the South African filmmaker. But as I think we've seen again and again, and we saw in the 20th century, Every time we try to bring heaven on earth, we also seem to bring hell up into earth too. Because now suddenly, and Miroslav Volf gets at this, I think, very well. Now suddenly, you do have to sort out the good and the bad. If, if, if we're going to realize the utopia that we want, expect, and in fact demand, well, you're going to have to break some eggs to have that utopia because... 
Here's the irony about utopia. It's always, turn to the subject, your utopia. This is utopia as you conceive of it. Well, what if someone else doesn't conceive of utopia the same way? What if in your utopia there's organ music and in somebody else's utopia there's heavy metal music? Well, I'm going to like organ and heavy metal music because I'll transcend it all with music. Well, what about, well, how noisy is your utopia going to be? Maybe your utopia is going to be about silence. Well, is it going to have music or are you going to have silence? Or you can have ocean, or you can have mountains, or oceans and mountains together. I mean, this is how people are, and people are dramatically, people are have a dramatically diff difficult time figuring out, in fact, what they want. So, so Schleiermacher says we're going to solve this by by going towards feelings. Now, now Kant comes along, and and God gets relocated into Kant. Okay, so now we're going to pick up on Hegel. What arose early in the nineteenth century was a new historical consciousness, a new philosophy of history, where, wherein history ends up having a philosophical importance that it didn't have before. Uh, one way of thinking about why this works this way is to, um, to think about that romantic sense and that Kantian sense that mind shapes nature, right? That the human mind categorizes, conceptualizes, objectifies nature. So that if you look at nature, you're finding out something about mind. Right? Well, likewise, if you look at society, you're finding out something about the shape of human consciousness at a particular era, right? Roman society would presumably reflect Roman consciousness. Greek society at the time of Plato would presumably reflect Greek consciousness. And therefore, history, both natural history and especially social history, will be a history of human consciousness, a history of human being. That's a new way of thinking about history. Uh, before the 19th century, history was um, more limited in its aims and goals. For instance, the history of religion might be what a Protestant would do in order to explain why Protestants are more like the early church than Catholics are. And of course, Catholics would return the favor by retelling the history of the church so that it's, it's clear that uh, Catholicism is more in continuity with the early church. But now, in the 19th century, you get a new consciousness. The early church, for instance, will be recognized as having a profoundly different consciousness than we in the modern 19th century. There's a huge historical distance. Those people are a different kind of consciousness than, than we are. How does our consciousness relate to their consciousness? How can we appropriate their views? And then there's a story for, about how Western consciousness got from, say, the consciousness of the early church or the consciousness of ancient Greece to where we are now. That history, therefore, is the history of who we are. To tell the story of past consciousness is like to tell, like telling the autobiography of the Western mind. Now again, every time you hear we, ask yourself, who's we? History of who we are. What is that we? The Western mind. Right? That's a new approach to history, a new approach to philosophy. If we want to know what the human mind is in the West, we need to tell the story of its origin and its development, its unfolding. We need to tell the story of the consciousness of ancient Greece, the consciousness of the early church, the consciousness of the Middle Ages, the consciousness of the Enlightenment, and now, finally, the consciousness of 19th century Germany, where it all comes to its culmination. At least that's what many 19th century Germans thought. The great representative of this philosophical approach to history and historical consciousness was the German philosopher Hegel, early in the 19th century. Hegel's project was to show the rational basis of all history by uh, uncovering the, the logic that unfolds in history. It's not an accident that we get from uh, the consciousness of ancient Greece to the consciousness of the early church to the consciousness of the Middle Ages finally culminating in the consciousness of Hegel himself. There's a logic that leads through all these stages. History has a rational shape uh, because there's this logic working itself out in history. One way that Hegel puts this uh, is that the real is the rational, the rational is the real. What is real historically is ultimately rational. It makes sense. There's a, a, a logic or a dialectic that leads up to it. Well, we'll get to that point. But first I need to introduce you to Hegel's key philosophical work. 
really his, his greatest philosophical work uh, by most estimations. It's called The Phenomenology of Spirit. See, right there, you got to pay attention to the title. We've been talking about the phenomenal and the noumenal. Well, we can't know the noumenal after Kant. We know the phenomenal. So now suddenly we're going to pay all the attention to the phenomenal. And, and that's an implicit in Schleierbach's theology. Remember, Schleierbach is a theologian, not a philosopher. Hegel's a philosopher. The phenomenology of spirit. Now this to us, well, is that religious? Or, or what, what, what is spirit? What is spirituality? That's always, again, it's a word that fudges. Every time you hear somebody use it, you have to pause and ask yourself, now what exactly do you mean by that? And you have to try and locate, well, what are you mapping? What are you, what are you trying to say with this? Well, Kant is going to have the, the phenomenology of spirit. Now spirit, again, if you listen to Paul Maxwell's video, he talks about Hegel with spirit. Now, Peter Carey is going to, or Philip Carey is going to say, let's use Geist, because if we use the foreign word with that, or the German word, what that tends to do is help us, help loosen us up in English from pouring in all of the stuff that we connect with spirit into that, which will actually probably lead us astray in some points. And at least if we use this word we're less familiar about, we can we can give it more of a pristine, a newer, a fresh, a fresher context in terms of how to try to understand and hopefully hear Hegel a little bit more clearly. Phenomenology of spirit or phenomenology of Geist. Um, <laughs> the words in the title themselves need a little bit of explanation. In fact, need a lot of explanation. And um, we can learn a lot about Hegel just by explaining the, those two key terms, the phenomenology of spirit or Geist. Let's start with that word spirit or Geist. Uh, the German word Geist means both mind and spirit, uh, like the French word esprit. Uh, the word Geistisch means intellectual, right? But uh, similar words, uh, Geistreich and so on, can mean spiritual, right? So, Geist is related to, by the way, the English word ghost, but there's nothing ghostly about it, sort of like the Holy Ghost in, in ancient uh, or old English liturgies, right? If you use uh, the old Anglican prayer books, it's the Holy Ghost, which means, of course, the Holy Spirit. Geist is spirit in that sense, not in the sense of ghost, but in the sense of spiritual being, mental or intellectual being. So um, you can see that Geist is related to that whole tradition in Platonism of mind or intellect. And it's, it's related to spirituality because of that tendency in Christian Platonism to associate the Platonist dichotomy between sensible and intelligible to the Christian dichotomy between flesh and spirit. Right? The sensible is the fleshly, the intelligible is the spiritual. So that the realm of intellect is the realm of spirit. Right? That's, that's what Geist designates for Hegel. Um, so Geist in Hegel is a, is a good deal like Plotinus' divine mind or Augustine's divine mind, right? that, that divine intellect. The difference, and here it's, it is a crucial difference, the difference is that in Platonism, both in Plotinus and in Christian Platonists like Augustine, the divine mind is unchanging. It's separate from the visible world, separate from the historical world, it's rich in intellectual content. It has all those Platonic forms in it. Uh, and it's always eternally been rich in intellectual content. In contrast, Hegel's notion of Geist is historical. The Geist in Hegel gets its content by getting involved in the temporal, historical, sensible world, the world of nature, the world of human social life. The, Hegel's Geist is a Zeitgeist, or Zeitgeist in German. Z-E-I-T, Geist, G-E-I-S-T. Uh, that's the spirit of the age, it's usually translated, right? The Zeitgeist, or spirit of the age, is Geist, the divine mind, in its involvement in history. Now, what's critical here, again, is if you walk up to someone on the street and say, the phenomenology of spirit, well, they won't listen to phenomenology because it's a word that's it's too complicated. But once you hear them say spirit, it's like, oh. Spirit. Spirit transcends. Spirit, now they think about the Force and, and Star Wars, spirit, spirit invades. Spirit is cool, spiritual, but not religion. Well, well, the subtle change that has happened now with Hegel 
is that spirit is not really transcendent. Spirit is down here with us. And spirit is what we do. And, and spirit is right here. You can have this phenomenology of spirit within the iron box of secularism. And, and it's all down here. And so, again, this is a spirit that Brett Weinstein and Sam Harris can both sign on to because we're just using this word spirit or spirituality as something down below. So even if you're a materialist, you can say, well, all of the all of the things that materialist people are doing and thinking and saying and dreaming and all the talk, all this down here that is available to us and acts as this is what is spirit and this is what is God. Okay? So that's this is all this is God all down here. And so then you can be a materialist and believe in God and this God spirit zeitgeist geist that's all down here and see now Hegel is going to say ah but the spirit is is making progress in history and the divine mind or geist doesn't get any content doesn't get any ideas without being involved in history it goes from a simple um, immediacy Hegel will call it into involvement with the external world of history and time and sense uh, experience, and finally culminates in self-understanding with philosophy. So what ends up happening is that Geist externalizes itself in human history. It, in fact, loses itself in the externalities of human history. And then, toward the end of history, it finds itself again through philosophical self-understanding. Oh, and now we have to look at that other word, phenomenology. What does that mean? comes from the Greek word phenomenon, meaning appearance. It's a word that Hegel actually made up. Uh, phenomenology means, for Hegel, the study of the appearances of consciousness in history. Right? How does consciousness, and ultimately Geist, make its appearance in history? Well, we study uh, the Geist of ancient Greece, the Geist of ancient Rome, the Geist of the early church, the Geist of the Middle Ages, and thus we trace this unfolding of Geist, this externalization of Geist, as it makes its its trip through history. Okay. And and, and what's interesting when you when you listen to the way Carey phrases it, I'm going to take Carey at his word. He's a very competent scholar. When you hear that, then okay, well now it's kind of personified. Well now it's kind of moving. Now it's kind of transcendental. And, and, and but it's moving among us. We we don't we don't need to imagine. You know, so okay, let's go back to Frodo and Tolkien. So let's say Frodo is let's say Hegel drops into Middle Earth. Well, well, where is where is Geist and and Frodo? Well, Geist is the working through of of Sauron and the Ring and and all of these things. But you don't need Tolkien. To have Geist in Middle Earth, okay, and and in fact, if someone, if if Gandalf would would whisper to Frodo and say, Tolkien, J.R.R. Tolkien, Frodo. Now we're going to get more into Feuerbach. Frodo would say, "Well, Tolkien is the name that we use to represent." The development of Geist within Middle Earth, this whole war with Sauron and good and evil, thesis, antithesis, synthesis. This is how we process this. But you don't actually need Tolkien writing or thinking or imagining to, to create Middle Earth. Tolkien is the product of Middle Earth. Okay, so that's phenomenology of Geist, the, the history of the appearances of Geist in human consciousness as it goes through the history of the world. Now, we need to introduce at this point another key element in Hegel's thought. And this is the element that Hegel's known for. History, history unfolds according to a logic that Hegel calls the dialectic. That's why the real is the rational, the rational is the real. What happens, what is real in history is rational because it unfolds logically according to this dialectic. Now, a dialectic is a Greek word. Uh, in Plato and Aristotle, well, in all of Greek uh, language, it simply means conversation. In Plato and Aristotle, it means 
uh, the kind of conversation where you have a logical argument. You have a back and forth, right? You have a, a back and forth, uh, you have refutation, you have criticism, and you have discovery, right? Dialectic is the kind of thing that Socrates got us started doing, right? So for Hegel, history is like an argument, like a Socratic argument, right? Like a back and forth between two people who are arguing with each other. The dialectic of history is a back and forth, a positive and a negative, and a resolution of the argument. So, in fact, there's three stages at every um, movement of the dialectic for Hegel. There's a positive stage, say, um, he calls it immediacy. You can call it a, a positive, you know, yes position, this is what I believe. And then there's a negative stage, no, it's not like that. And then there's a resolution, which captures both the positive and the negative. Uh, it's like the kind of argument you have where, uh, you know, you're arguing with someone else and um, you don't just beat them in the argument, but you recognize that the other person has a point, but you have a point too and the other person recognizes that. And at the resolution of the argument, the two of you agree in a way that, that captures the point of the other person and captures your point, does justice to them both, but combines them in a richer view of the whole, right? Imagine that you have that kind of argument, right? It changes your mind, but you don't give up the view that you had. Rather, you incorporate it into a larger vision that includes both your view and the opposite view. That's the dialectic of history, according to Hegel. Right? History unfolds like that kind of argument. Um, let me give you an example. Heraclitus. By the way, this is my example, not Hegel's. Hegel's examples are more complicated than this. Um, Heraclitus, back in ancient Greece, said... Everything flows. Everything's in movement. Nothing stands still. You can't step into the same river twice, Heraclitus said. Then along comes Parmenides and says, change is illusion. Right? Only, uh, the only real being is, is unchanging being. The world of becoming is illusion. So for Heraclitus, the world of becoming is everything. For Parmenides, the world of becoming is illusion. All there is is being. And then along comes Plato who gives us a two-tiered universe. There's a world of becoming down there in the cave. Then there's the world of being up there outside the cave. They're both real, although one is more real than the other. Um, so what Plato has done is, is said, well, Heraclitus is right about the world of the cave. Parmenides is right about the world above the cave. They both caught one aspect of the truth. Put them together in the right way, and you've got um, a, a richer concept of what the truth really is. So that's an example of a dialectical movement. Right? You've got a thesis stated by Heraclitus, its antithesis stated by Parmenides, and Plato proposes a synthesis. This language of thesis, antithesis, and synthesis was devised by a later Hegelian, actually by a Marxist. But it's, it's reasonably good language to describe the movement of the dialectic. A thesis, which is a positive statement, an antithesis, which is a negative statement, and then a resolution or synthesis at a higher level. Hegel's own word for this resolution or synthesis was subsumption. I'll translate it. The, the uh, German word is Aufhebung. It means literally picking up. And this can be used in the sense of removing something, hence canceling or abolishing those previous positions. But it can also be used in the sense of raising to a higher level, right? As in the sense of preserving it at a higher level. Now, again, even implicit in our language, all this talk at a higher level, this idea of, so we think of it, say, progress, we often think left to right. So you have this progression, but at a higher level, you get this thesis, antithesis, synthesis, thesis, antithesis, synthesis. And so you're building your Tower of Babel. And, well, what is, what is happening to the Geist? Well, the Geist is growing. And so again, back to Tolkien, there is there is no Tolkien. You have Geist in Middle Earth that say Frodo and Sam sit down and have a philosophical conversation and Geist is growing in Middle Earth. But but no, Tolkien is we project Tolkien onto the sky. At a higher level. So this resolution, this third movement or moment in the dialectic is a subsumption, a picking up, a raising to a new level, which abolishes the one-sidedness of the early opinions, right? Plato, Plato is not a Heraclitean, he's not a Parmenidean, right? He, in a sense, he rejects both Heraclitus and Parmenides, he cancels their positions, he abolishes their positions. But in another sense, he preserves both their positions, right? So this, this word Aufhebung with its ambiguity, 
the sense of both canceling and preserving, or lifting up in the sense of both removing and, uh, and, and raising to a higher level. That ambiguity is crucial to Hegel's thought. It's very useful because it captures this logic where the earlier positions are abolished in their one-sidedness, but preserved in their essential truth, right, uh, and incorporated into a larger whole. That's the movement of consciousness for Hegel. That's the movement of history. It's the movement of Geist in history. Now, this movement of dialectic, of subsumption, overcomes opposition, right? That third movement is a resolution. It unifies. It takes what had been in conflict and incorporates them, incorporates these. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit because I want to get to some places. Self-alienation, its externalization, it has now recognized itself in absolute knowledge. Or at least that's one interpretation of Hegel. Maybe Hegel is thinking that, the, that absolute knowledge is yet to come, but he's just pointing the way. Right? But in any case, Hegel clearly thinks that his own philosophy is a crucial stage in the uh, self-realization of Geist, the self-understanding of Geist. Now, let's place religion in this story. Think about, first of all, uh, how Geist is related to traditional concepts of God. First of all, Geist is not ultimately other than the world. Right? This is not a transcendent God who stands outside the world. This is not the God of classical theism. Right? It's more like Spinoza's notion of God. It's more like pantheism because uh, Geist really is, is present in, finds itself in, the whole external world. Um, but it's not uh, sort of ahistorical the way Spinoza is, right? Um, also, like the classical tradition now, um, uh, there's Plotinus's notion of divine mind, which we compared Geist to. Um, and in Plotinus, again, the divine mind is, is the, sec the hidden secret at the bottom of the human mind, right? So once again, uh, Geist is present not only in history but in human consciousness, right? Like Spinoza, Geist is there in nature. In fact, everything is Geist, and especially our mind is Geist. And yet, different from Spinoza and Plotinus, we have to see Geist in motion in history. That's the, the uniquely Hegelian thing. Now, in order to understand why Hegel wants to set Geist in motion, get it involved in history. I think we need to look at Hegel's concept of religion. Because it turns out that the last stage in the development of Geist before absolute knowledge is the stage of religion. And in particular, the highest stage of religion is the revealed religion. Interestingly enough, not natural religion, but revealed religion. And for Hegel, of course, the revealed religion is Christianity. Now, for Hegel, the key idea of the revealed religion is the incarnation. One of the interesting phenomena in later 19th century German philosophy is, is that these German philosophers are interested in making sense of Orthodox Christian doctrines. Uh, Schleiermacher had a hard time making sense of the incarnation, whereas for Hegel, the incarnation is absolutely central to the revealed religion. However, it's the incarnation understood in a specifically philosophical way. For Hegel takes the revealed religion Christianity to be um, kind of mythological, right? It's all about uh, particular figures in history, sort of like pagan myth. What we have to do is sort of, in a standard Platonist way, allegorize this history. Uh, Hegel will call it conceptualize it, right? Take it from the level of representation or picture thinking and lift it up, subsume it into uh, a conceptual form. See, now, when you listen to Peterson, Peterson does this. Peterson does this a lot. And now you could have a conversation with Peterson whether this is what he is merely doing. Or And again, I would assume that Peterson, he's an open agnostic. It's so hard to categorize. But this is what he does with his with his with his mythological teachings. Because the 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 cool thing about mythology is that it's so infinitely translatable is that you can make almost anything you can go almost anywhere from somewhere else 
and you can watch the Avengers movies and you can relate to it. And so, so mythology, mythology is very translatable and, and Hegel sees this. So then of course, Hegel deep 19th century Germany, deeply, deeply Christian place. So, you know, you know, look at many, you know, you've got Nietzsche dealing with Christianity. You've got Kierkegaard dealing with the, Christianity. Hegel's deeply embedded within Christendom. And so he's he's wrestling with these things. And so now there's a mythology that comes about and we can use mythology. And now because of the skepticism we have, because of our new knowledge about with Darwin and via this, we can't go with the fundamentalists anymore, but we want to save Christianity and we want to see Christianity as this, this great triumph that has been presented to us, but we don't know how to use it anymore because the old traditional ways of using it seem naive and uninformed and uneducated. And so now we're going to move and we're going to do, we're going to use it mythologically. But now, of course, later in the 20th century, as I talk about, Christian morality will continue to be assumed in 19th and early 20th century. Into the 20th century, then the Christian morality gets reduced. And at that point, we're just at the layer of Geist run wild and, and Geist in all. And then we take a look at these, these, these lowest, common all, lowest common denominator religions and say, okay, well, this is what we can find in common with all the religions. That's where we're going we're gonna to locate Geist. And then you get into something a little bit more full-fledged pantheon, uh, pantheism. Lewis, again, in, in Miracles and some of his other books, he believes pantheism is the most natural of all religious moves. That's interesting to think about when you think about like this, this conscious, this, this continuous cosmos, Taylor's thing, and then the axial age split things. Now, now pantheism comes back and it's okay, one one whole thing but then you're going to have splitness within it because the world that we experience is illusion and we're going to get to the place we want to see beyond illusion we're going to call that enlightenment so on and so forth but i want to get to the end here of of what he's going to say about about hegel because he, he makes some good comments form so what happens when you take the notion of incarnation and subsume it in conceptual form hegel thinks is that you recognize that geist is what is incarnate in the world Right? The incarnation is a kind of mythological indication of the real truth, which is that it is Geist that enters the world of history, enters the world of alienation, division, negativity, and suffering. There is a kind of speculative Good Friday in Hegel. It's called, there's a, there's a suffering of Geist as it, as it becomes incarnate in this world that is alien from it because it's a world of material being uh, of division, suffering, of misunderstanding, of not understanding the whole. And Geist is all about understanding the whole. So philosophy has the job of subsuming religion, right? Religion is, is a form of picture thinking. Religion is a form of consciousness which thinks about uh, ultimate truth in terms of stories about individuals like Christ. And what philosophy does is it subsumes this picture thinking, lifts it up to a new level, a level of philosophical conceptuality. It takes representation or picture thinking, Vorstellung in German, and subsumes it at the level of a concept, a begriff. So it preserves its true content while abolishing its mythological form. So we're making our way to Boltmann in Paul Maxwell's little sequence and this is critical because what happens is modern people read let's say about jesus ascension and they say huh but heaven isn't up there we send satellites up there the chinese just put a put a machine on the the back side of the moon they didn't bump into jesus and our dead relatives well, so what are we talking about? Well, we're going to conceptualize this. And when well, you go from concept into mythology and 
And again, Peterson is agnostic with a lot of these pieces. And Peterson's main argument is that if we lose the mythology, if we lose the metaphorical underpinnings, we will lose the game because this is how human beings work. Peterson is a psychologist, and he's saying this is what we need with, with well-being and for flourishing. And again, Paul Maxwell begins that video about well-being and flourishing. And so we need this stuff. But then, of course, other people come up and say, but how real is it? Is it is it just that we need these stories? Do Frodo and Sam sit down and say, you know, it's really one, one of the dramatic, interesting things about Tolkien and Middle Earth is that there is no religion there per se. And that was intentional on Tolkien's part. Well, why? <laughs> well, that's interesting. Why? We can have the, the Church of Tolkien and Middle Earth what's going on? And, and so Sam and Frodo sit down and, and they say, well, we should, we should really have a religion. Well, well, why? Well, because Geist needs to subsume religion into philosophy. And now here's, here's the move that, you know, to follow the hermeneutics of suspicions, it just seems all too convenient. Well, a philosopher decides that religion is subsumed into philosophy. And of course, Theologians decide that philosophy is subsumed into religion, and and so then what 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 we begin doing is all of this constant thing. Now the someone sent me an email about integral thinking, and I've watched some of their videos, and I think they make some good points. But there's there's a deeply Hegelian notion going on there, and and the difficult thing with with really indulging in a lot of Hegelian thinking is that I almost always find myself at the top of a long process. Well, why is that? Am I really at the pinnacle or is now to play the postmodern or is that just me telling a story that privileges me in certain special ways? Well, I should, I should be careful of that impulse in myself. It's very real. So, but, but but the key thing here is that, so you have all this mythology and what we have in the Bible is this mythology. And so, well, now the question is going to be, well, how can we, what can we learn from this mythology in terms, in terms of being able to conceptualize it and apply it within our life? That's the move. Now, this isn't a unique move. And again, as I talked to Ron Dart, this is, this move has been made again and again and again and again. And it's not an... It's not an immoral move or a, a move that shouldn't happen. Every time Jesus tells a parable, now we don't, when Jesus tells the parable of the, the father with two sons, we're not really imagining that over here in this other country, there's a man with two sons and one asks for his inheritance and so on and so forth. We understand what a parable is and we understand how a parable works. And we hear the parable and we say, that's a story and we should conceptualize it and derive a meaning from it and this is what preachers do and then we spin this off and we conceptualize derive a meaning and try to apply it there's nothing wrong with any of these moves but but what i want to pay attention to in this are the deep ways in which the history of these moves changes our subtle biases and presuppositions about the way the world works and, and in some ways, for centuries, or just at least two or three centuries, we've been saying, oh, all this Christian formation has given you all these presuppositions that you believe there was a, there was a Mary who had not had sex and then found herself pregnant and an angel shows up and tells her about it and Joseph has a dream and an angel shows up and I've never seen an angel, so I'm skeptical about angels. But then the person who's spiritual over here says, I've seen lots of angels. I have no problem believing those stories at all because angels are all over the place. And there's Jesus and Mary and Joseph, and then there's all of these other people too. There's there's Fred and Ethel and 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 Lucy and Ricky and Little and, you know, I was going to say Little Fred, but that would really mess up I Love Lucy. Little Ricky. So... There's angels everywhere. And so then the question is, well, where can, how, how can we have discipline of canon? How can we have a con coherent story? Because in the enormous complexity, near universal complexity of the world, action requires that we take all of this stuff down and we apply it somewhere. Am I going to pray to Jesus or am I going to pray to some other name? Well, how do I know? How do I decide? Is Jesus just the manifest, manifestation of Geist? 
or is Jesus one manifestation of the divine or the top? Well, how do I know this? Well, here you never have the question of contemporary, contemporary pluralism. But all of this is set into motion through this history of religion. And so, again, as Paul, we had Kant, we have Hegel, we have Feuerbach, and Feuerbach says, well, we got all this stuff below. Well, Tolkien or Frodo and Sam are saying, well, where did we get this? I, Gandalf once said this name Tolkien. Well, we're Tolkien is a useful conceptualization of Geist that is working underneath the surface of Middle Earth. You've also just fundamentally changed Tolkien. And you've also fundamentally changed the nature of that entire drama. And, okay, let's say you've done it. Be aware that you've done it. And be aware that that move is going to have implications and probably unforeseen implications in terms of how Frodo and Sam conceptualize their lives and the decisions that they make about should they carry this ring to Mordor? Um, and they're taking the ho they're taking the hobbits to Isengard. So, so what is the world? This is this is our quest. We want to know, but can we know? I'm about out of time. I've got some things I got to do. But I again, we're um, we're we're going to be jumping now then back into Paul Maxwell's because I, I wanted to talk more about. Kant. I wanted to talk more about Hegel. Back when I talked about the Three Craters video, I talked more about Feierbach because, Feierbach because, again, Rachel Fulton Brown, I think quite rightly in a blog post, had brought Feierbach in it. So at some point, we're going to have to get to Boltman, and then we'll probably take a look at N.T. Wright and, and some of that history because, again, the, the question is, well, how do we locate Peterson? Well, He's, he's here in the mix. And so some people listen to him and say, well, he fits right in with, with mainline Christianity, all of this move towards symbolism. But mainline Christianity has now moved on to their, their, their social justice, political activist agenda that makes Peterson poison. And the, the evangelicals, well, they like, they hear a lot of, they're interested in Peterson because... He's making people interested in Christianity, but they listen to him and say, well, does he really believe in God or is God just a concept? And we're trying to figure that out. And then a lot of people are listening to Peterson and hearing this and stuff outside of their consciousness frame is getting strangely moved and it's leaking into their conscious frame. And they think, well, maybe I'll read the Bible. Well, maybe I'll listen to Paul Vanderclay. Well, maybe I'll go to church. And okay, well, let's... Uh, Let's talk about what you've been listening to and let's talk more about this and let's start to piece this stuff together and and let's start to figure it out and let's read Peterson's footnotes like noted in network and let's let's do some homework and figure this stuff out and see what we can learn. Okay, that's that's this whole project. So I'm out of time. Uh leave a comment. I'll post this, I don't know, Friday or Saturday. I just did the sermon thing. And anyway, thanks for watching.